Bienvenue à tous dans cette série de vidéos préparées par l'Association des climato-réalistes où l'on va donner la parole à Richard Linzen. Richard Linzen est l'un des plus grands climatologues au monde qui a fait toute sa carrière au prestigieux MIT, le Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Il a aussi travaillé pour le GIEC, le fameux groupe d'experts intergouvernemental sur l'évolution du climat. Et il est enfin euh, membre de, euh, du comité scientifique de notre association. Et Richard Linzen ne croit pas que le climat soit déréglé ou que nous vivrions une crise climatique. Nous faisons donc fausse route quand nous nous imaginons que nous devons nous alarmer de l'évolution des températures. L'effet de serre, la fonte de la banquise, les cyclones, mais aussi le fonctionnement du GIEC, la fabrique du consensus ou encore l'idéologie qui règne dans la science aujourd'hui, c'est de tout cela dont Richard Linzen va nous entretenir. Richard Linzen, bonjour. Bonjour. Hello. Thank you for coming. We're gonna, My pleasure. We're going to speak uh, in English and uh, Good. there will be <laughs> subtitles in French for our French uh, sure. viewers. And uh, first of all, I would like you to present yourself. Tell us to, uh, who you are and what you did and what, uh, and what is uh, your work in the field of climatology. Well, first of all, until 1990, I would never have called myself a climatologist. No one in my department ever called themselves a climatologist. I was a meteorologist, a dynamic meteorologist. There were oceanographers, there were marine geochemists, there were geologists. All of us were interested in climate as a component of what we were doing. It was an interesting question. The people who were, quote, climatologists That term was reserved for the record keepers for the government. They kept records. It was a, a serious job, but you know, not very theoretical. Uh, there were other people who were very interested in climate, or well, many of us were, uh, most notably, for instance, uh, in Leningrad at that time, today, St. Petersburg. There was the uh, Hydrodynamic Institute or something like that. And it had a lot of people working on climate. Uh, there was a man called uh, Yuri Israel, there's Budiko, Budiko was there. Uh, but, you know, it was something, a topic within the general fields. The, today, today, in my department at MIT, everyone's a climate scientist, even if they don't work on climate. So what did uh, actually change at the time? Um, Money. The, the difference between, uh, first of all... Look, could... look at France. When I was a student, there was one person in Paris who worked in the atmosphere, a man called Kenney. Today there are hundreds, and most of them know very little. And the reason is, you know, once this became a, an important political issue, then funding came and you had a new group of people. This used to be a very small field. And how do you define it? And, uh, how do I define to, it? To, to def There's to no def definition. Uh, you know, there were too few people who uh, actually were willing interested in studying the system. So you then developed areas uh, like uh, impacts. So for instance, in Germany, you have the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impacts. What does this mean? This means that, uh, you know, you may know nothing about climate. Maybe you're working on uh, mice or cockroaches or God knows what. If your proposal says the impact of climate on these, now you're a climate scientist. So most climate scientists are impact studies because that includes anyone who's studying anything. How do you scientifically distinguish uh, climate from meteorology? Climate, climate well, meteorology. the climate system of course involves the atmosphere, the oceans, to some extent the solid earth, the orbital mechanics, solar physics. It involves so many things that there's no one who's really an expert in all of it, including myself. 
uh, when you get to the paleo climate, you know, the analysis of ice cores, the arguments about uh, isotopes of oxygen, do they represent ice or temperature and so on, uh, you are dealing with uh, a lot of topics and frankly I know of no one who's an expert in all of them. You also, when you get into CO2 and you start demonizing it, you better also know about photosynthesis and the chemistry of that. So, you know, it was always understood this was uh, the, one of the best examples I know of, of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary studies. And people understood uh, at one time that you made your contribution, uh, you worked with other people and so on. Uh, the notion that I would be an expert in uh, glaciation uh, would be wrong. I mean, uh, I know of only two or three real experts in glaciation. I might ask them for help if I were working on it. But uh, to assume that a person who says I'm a climate scientist knows all these things, that would be sheer nonsense. You mean that climatology is, a, is, a, is too big? Yeah, to sure. A, a it's science. a kind of synthesis of so many things. Uh, you can have your ideas on it. You can look at specific things. At one time, uh, you know, I think the Russians had it pretty much right during the Soviet period in that uh, they looked at the data, proxy data mostly for climate, and they realized that there were two crucial questions. One, uh, they observed that in most major climate changes, the tropics were relatively constant, within a couple of degrees. Mm -hmm. What changed was the difference in temperature between the equator and the pole. And this was a matter of dynamics. So you had these questions and they were some. In terms of phenomenology, uh, you, you had the major glaciations, you had the Eocene, you had other things going on. So there were questions, how did they work? There were questions, why did ice begin a few million years ago? What was its impact? And a lot of great questions, and uh, people worked on it from their disciplinary views and so on, contributing what they could. Um, Milankovic, for instance, who I think gave the best insight into the ice ages, was an astro astrophysicist. So maybe you could explain what Milankovic did. Okay, what he, said. what he did was relatively simple. We had begun to realize that there were cycles of glaciation. Uh, that roughly speaking, there was a dominant period of about 100,000 years, but there were other things going on. He realized that with these large ice sheets, as with any glacier, what was important? What is important with glaciers is summer. Essentially, if summer is hot, then the snow that accumulated in the winter, which always accumulates in winter, winter is always cold, won't last. If the summers are cold, the ice lasts, and so there is a new base that it builds on and it builds on and it builds on. It has thousands of years. It can build to two kilometers, three kilometers, mm -hmm. enough to be noticeable. Um, and then, you know, it breaks in certain ways and so on. At any rate, Milankovic realized that the crucial thing uh, would be that. And he also realized that due to the orbits of the Earth, the obliquity, the precession of the equinoxes, the eccentricity, that uh, the Arctic temperature, Arctic insulation, excuse me, not temperature, uh, changes a lot. So, you know, for example, when we talk about doubling CO2, 
we talk about three watts per meter squared. But if you look at the insulation at, uh, let's say, 65 degrees north, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, varies 100 watts per meter squared over these orbital variations. So he suggested this probably was driving the glacial cycles. Now, you know, when you have people in different disciplines looking at things, different backgrounds, you'll make mistakes. And so there was a big program in the U.S. called CLIMAP uh, about 30, 40 years ago mm -hmm. to examine the last glacial maximum, which was about 18,000 years ago. And they were looking at uh, the Milankovic parameter, the insulation at 65 degrees in June. And they said it had uh, similar peaks to the glaciation, but it didn't seem to work well. They were comparing insulation with ice volume. Assuming that it was the same uh, equivalent. That one caused the other, that's what they did. You know, it took two young scientists, a couple of Swedes, Edvardsson and some colleagues, and then another guy, Gerard Rowe, to realize that there was a stupid error in this. If you're looking at the insulation, the incoming sunlight, you want to compare it with the rate of change of ice volume, not the ice volume. And that worked beautifully. So the de derivative of the volume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that correlates excellently. Better than almost anything I've seen in geophysics. W when did it take place, this discovery? This, this work? Yes. Probably 2009. It was very recent. 2003. Uh, they didn't know of each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, these were just people reflecting on it. So, do you, do you think that this is a, well, a major think, contribution I, I, in the I field? I think for the ice ages, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you had, you know, the CO2. They were saying, well, they were looking at globally average CO2, not the one that was relevant. Mm -hmm. That varies a lot. Mm -hmm. So, they're saying, yeah, we, we agree, this can't cause it. It must be due to the orbits. Mm -hmm. But the CO2 must amplify it, otherwise it couldn't occur. Yes, it will. It's crazy. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll speak uh, yeah. about this, of course. Uh, that's just bizarre. Um, no, but, uh, you know, in a normal world, these guys, uh, you know, Edwardson et al., would get prizes for this. This is not a normal world. So they didn't get anything? No, no recognition, whatever. In fact, wrote to publish it had to include a little sentence in it saying this has no implications for CO2 at all. 